So this is a topic that, I mean, I, of course I've talked about prayer. I talked about it last week, but I haven't really just done a whole, an entire Zoom call on prayer. So I think this is as good as time as any. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the importance of prayer, but then talk about questions about prayer. Obviously, that's why it's called a theology of prayer, answering tough questions about prayer, right? So you're like, yes, Eric, I understand. That's why it's that's why it's called what it's called. So anyways, um, let's get started here. So let's go ahead and start with a little some definitions of prayer. Uh, this is a pretty good definition from a long time ago by John Bunyan, uh, eons and eons ago, but just because just because they say it a long time ago or it's really old doesn't mean it's not true of course it doesn't make any difference what time uh what century it, this was written in but it's, it's still as relevant it was then as it is for today he says pr- he said prayer is a sincere sensible affectionate pouring out of the heart or soul to god through christ and the strength and assistance of the holy spirit for such things as God hath promised, or according to the word, for the good of the church, with submission and faith to the will of God. So that's a pretty decent definition there. I don't mind that. Well, why do we pray? Well, hopefully we think about our motives. Hopefully we do desire a closer relationship with God or communion with God or a richer, I think communion is like a richer word to use. Um, Certainly prayer is one of the most important ways we come to know God on a deeper level. And obviously one of the goals of prayer is communion and fellowship. You know, when we come to God and we start talking to him, we're we're having fellowship with him. We're talking to God. You know, just like we say, let's go hang out with a brother or sister in the Lord and let's have some fellowship. You know, fellowship is not just hanging out, talking about the uh, Super Bowl. Fellowship is talking about the things of God, right? Um, The things that, God is doing in your life or things God doing other people's lives, you know, fellowship is really um, bringing God into the discussion. And so when you go out and hang out with your brothers or sisters or in church, wherever you are, hopefully you're having some rich fellowship, but that's what God wants with us. He wants that rich fellowship as well. And of course, prayer is the one of the main ways that he accomplishes that. So let me go ahead and just mention a few things of what we see in Scripture, some of the prayers we see in Scripture, because we have a lot of things to discuss. Um, one passage that stands out as a proof text is 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 2. And this is where Paul tells Timothy about how to pray. You know, he says to him to make, he wants him to make supplications. He wants him to make intercessions. He wants him to make have thanksgivings on behalf of people and especially on those having political power around them so and he wants prayer for the believing community to lead a peaceful and quiet life to be a good witness right so paul believed these four things um you know these things were ways of speaking with god that could bring about the condition and stability of the church okay we see in Philippians 4, the proof, when I say proof text, that's where we take a passage out of context. You don't want to get in the habit of doing that because you want to read the Bible in context. That's a constant problem with Christians when they try to make theological points. Is they quote one verse, they're one verse, I call them one verse or two verse Christians. Um, but my point is that, so if you read Philippians 4, 6, you'd have to read the entire chapter of Philippians 4 and probably the whole book of Philippians as well to see where it fits in. But we see in Philippians 4, 6 that Paul talks about letting our requests be made known, known to God, not being anxious. And he exhorts, you know, the community there in Philippi to avoid anxiousness. Instead, bring their requests known, the requests they have to God by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Um, you know, Paul is talking about these are some of the things that can help, you know, your anxiety. But it's important to understand that when we use that verse, like we go to people who are struggling with anxiety, they have circumstances that are overwhelming in their lives or something's going on, we have to understand we just quote that verse to them that isn't going to necessarily fix the problem. It's not like a magic formula, like just do what Paul says. Don't be anxious about anything. Prayer to God. Just pray. Just pray. You won't be anxious anymore. Well, um, it's true. We're supposed to do that. But... What that really is supposed to do is 
it's a way of enabling we're, we're allowing God into the situation to bring us through those circumstances. It doesn't mean the circumstances necessarily change, but we change and we are given something through that prayer through, that will help us get through those circumstances, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that all anxiety goes away and it's like a magic formula, but it certainly helps um, to practice these things, right? Um, some people have chronic anxiety. I mean, I know people have chronic anxiety. They take medication. I understand that. They just can't stop worrying uh, about things they can't control. Their mind is very anxious. Sometimes you need help. You need to get some counseling, need some medication. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not against that. I'm just saying that when you use this text, um, you know, we don't want to use it as like a magic, magic formula. You know, I just pray this and it's all gone. Well, you, you, hopefully you'll change in the situation, but the circumstances may not necessarily change, but you will be changed in the situation. Now we talk about supplication. We're talking about petitionary prayer that focuses generally on our own needs and our own situation. Of course, intercessory prayer is when we focus on the situation needs of others. And sometimes I'm sure many of us in our Christian lives that God will bring people to our mind or situations to our mind, things we need to pray about. He wants us to intercede. Um, and that happens a lot within the Old Testament. You see where intercession is one of the main responsibilities of those that led the people of God, people like Abraham, priests. The priests, of course, had a role for interceding. Prophets like Moses, Samuel, Elijah, Daniel, Amos. Daniel lays out a lot of prayers in the book of Daniel. You can see how he prays. But they're praying in behalf of the community, right? Sometimes they're confessing sins. They're going before God. They're pouring themselves out before God. Um, but intercession, of course, was a common characteristic of Israel's priesthood in Israel's history. Of course, we become, um, Jesus is our high priest now. And of course, we are a priesthood of believers. And we are called to intercede as well. To, to, on behalf of others, behalf of situations, behalf of the nation. So we get the privilege of doing that. We also see sometimes in scripture, um, you know, the need for confessional prayer. That's what happens in Daniel, the book of Daniel, when he's calling out to God, asking for forgiveness for the sins of Israel, how they sinned against God. They're in a captivity. They've been exiled, which is a sad uh, case in Israel's history. In many cases, they were exiled. And of course, we are believers and we our past, present, future sins are forgiven, but we still sin in this world. And when we do sin, of course, we the, the relationship with God can be disrupted. Not our not that it's broken, um, not that the fellowship is gone. It's just that there's an it's something is impacted there. It's not as we're not as close to God as we want to. And sometimes we have to just confess to the Lord, like first John one talks about confessing our sins. Um you know, quickly. And, you know, we're in a constant state of doing that in repentance. And so that's just part of the, our prayer lives. You know, when I go to pray, I always ask God to forgive me of any unconfessed sins, to blot out any unconfessed sins. I can't, it's not like you can recall, the Holy Spirit's going to recall every single sin you've committed that day or the day before. Very rarely is that going to happen. So, of course, we do our best to try to, um, you know, remember things and with the Holy Spirit's help. Now, petitional, you see um, also some of these things in the petitional psalms. If you read the psalmist, there's times where the psalmist talks about a heaviness or a weariness from his sin. It's, it's weighing him down. And, you know, so the psalms talk about confessing their sins as a freedom, a release to God, right? A release before God. So God certainly knows that confession is necessarily necessary, and we can have confidence that God hears our confession right? So that should be part of our regular, um, hopefully somewhat mixed within, within our prayer life. Um, now, there is a lot of times also in the New Testament where when Paul, is, when Paul starts out his letters, as you probably know, or else he's praying for the, you know, he writes to Colossae, he writes to Ephesus, he writes, he's writing to a group of people, you know, so when he prays the prayers, when Paul prays a prayer and he says, I pray for you that you may be strengthened by the spirit in the inner man, like in Ephesians, and you may understand the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Jesus, he talks about that in Ephesians. When he says, I pray for you, he's praying for that community as a whole. Okay, so it's not about just an individual. So when we read it, 
we need to understand that Paul, when he says you there, it's plural. He's writing to a community, right? He's praying this for the community. So Paul gives thanks a lot. He gives thanks 46 times. Weaved in with prayer a lot of times in his letters, okay? You know, there was something maybe we all learned as new believers, or maybe you haven't ever heard this, but we, we would teach the ACTS acronym, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplications. And that's how we kind of teach people to pray sometimes. But we talked about, you know, we talk about how we, when we, we're confessing, as I said before, we're agreeing with God about our sins, seeking restoration. Adoration focuses on worshiping God. And Thanksgiving focuses on what, who he is, what he's done in our lives and the lives of others. And of course, intercession involves us, as I said, fulfilling the role as priests where we beseech God in the behalf of others. So that's a decent acronym to follow. But I mean, I know it's kind of basic, but some people still follow that in their prayer life. Nothing wrong with that. So what does it mean to pray in the spirit? When you talk about praying in the spirit, um, Paul talks about that in Ephesians six eighteen. Jude talks about that in Jude one twenty. Of course, the context in Ephesians is spiritual warfare. And in Jude, it's not quite the same context. But when Paul talks about that in Ephesians uh, 6, as I said, the context of Ephesians chapter 6, he's talking about all times. When he says all times, there's a constant need for us to be dependent on the spirit and prayer. We, of course, we can pray at all times. In the spirit we can we have access to god now 24 hours a day like i said last week you don't have to go into a temple or a building we can talk to god in our cars when we walk in our bedroom when we're making dinner when we're taking a shower when we're playing a sport whatever it is you know we can talk to god all the time now and the the parts the uh particip- the uh w- when he's talking about in jude 20 ephesians 6 18 that about praying He's talking about there's a word for prayer. It does not, it, he's not talking about like a special kind of prayer, the participle, okay? That he's not talking about a very, it's not like a super, it's not like a different kind of prayer, a special kind of prayer. Um, it's just following the Spirit's leadership and power, okay, in the Spirit. Now, um, and it's to include, you know, in Ephesians 6, he says, include all prayer and supplication, indicating that. This prayer invites God to supply all our needs in battle, right? But it also includes all sorts of prayers such as confession and thanksgiving. Now, the rally of it is, uh, when it comes to Ephesians 6, we're also to keep alert. You know, he talks about keeping alert in this prayer. That means that we're conscious, conscientious of the enemy's threats and ready for his plots. And we should be ready to persevere in prayer, never giving up. And, you know, he talks about praying for all the saints. And so... We need to realize our spiritual battle is not individual, individualistic. It's it's really corporate, okay? Because once again, he's writing to a group of believers, right? He's writing to a community, okay? I wasn't there. You weren't there. Remember, the Bible wasn't written to us, but it was written for us, right? You're not in Ephesus. I'm not in Ephesus, but an application can be made into our own lives. And it's We need to realize that we're supposed to pray for the body of believers to be protected from evil, of course, and to stand strong in the midst of the enemy's attacks, but also where Paul talks about, you know, the context of that chapter about putting on the armor of God, um, the helmet of salvation, all those things, but we're supposed to be on the alert and praying at all times in the spirit for our brothers and sisters, okay? And that's a good thing. Now, there is a way that we may not be praying in the spirit there is an op there's something opposite that can happen and that's talked about in james chapter 4 verses 2 to 3 another proof text where he says you ask you do not have because you do not ask you do not you do, you ask and don't receive because you ask wrongly you spend it on your own passion so that's what we're not praying in the spirit because we're really praying in the in light of selfish motives we're not that's not in line with the spirit so um obviously there's things we could pray about where it's not in line with god's will or the holy spirit you just that's why you need to be sensitive to what you're praying about now we talk about praying in jesus's name um you know we say that the conclusion of a lot of our prayers it's very traditional and sometimes you may say why do we do that 
you know, we just do it because we're supposed to do it. Like a lot of things we do, we never ask why, we just do it, right? Like we pray for God to bless the food. Why, is the food dirty or something? Is it like defiled? Like, I, God bless this food. I mean, food's not dirty, okay? It's not, it's not unclean, okay? Now, I have no problem asking God to bless your, thank you, thanking him for the food and, you know, whatever. I mean, nothing wrong with that, thanking him for the food he provided, but you don't, the food isn't necessarily dirty, okay? So, but we just do that. I know we do that in our prayers. So you just got to think about that. But anyway, so when we pray in Jesus' name, we're recognizing, obviously, his unique role, right? He is the mediator between God and us, and he is the one that allows us to pray. Now, when Jesus says, in John 14, 13 to 14, another proof text where he says, and I will do whatever you ask him, I will do whatever you ask in my name, so the Son may bring glory to the Father. You ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Of course, some misapply this proof text to assume that whatever you ask for, you can just ask for anything and tag Jesus' name on the end, and God will do it. It's like a magic formula. That's not the way that works. Okay? What we pray for in Jesus' name, or we ask in Jesus' name, is... The, the things that are important to him, for things that are important to him. Now, you may say, what's important to Jesus? Well, you know, he did say in Matthew chapter 6 how to pray, and he did give a model to his disciples how to pray. They come to him and say, how do we pray? He says, listen here. He gives a Jewish prayer. If you look at all the Jewish prayers, they, it's just like this one. In the history of Judy, he looked at liturgical prayer, some of their prayers. It's got the same things. This is not a unique new prayer that he's offering here. It's it's in line with all the other Jewish prayers. If you study Jewish prayer, he says, you say, God, you call out to God, our father, our Vinu, our father, our king. That's the acknowledgement of who God is. You don't, you start your prayer life out with acknowledgement of who God is. He says, hallowed be your name or sanctify the name of God. He wants God's name sanctified in the world. That means to make God's name holy because we can profane it by our actions or words, right? If you ever read Ezekiel, God says there through Ezekiel, it says, you profane my name. So you have profaned my name and I'm gonna act for my glory right now. They defiled his name, profaned his name. So of course we pray that God's name, Jesus wants God's name because his name is holy to be sanctified in the whole world. Of course, Jesus says, pray for the rule or kingship of God or the kingdom of God to be advanced. On earth as it is in heaven we pray for god's rule and reign because jesus of course came to bring the reign of god he said the kingdom of god is here repent and believe the good news the kingdom of god is here i'm the king i'm the davidic king i'm bringing the rule of god you get to come under my reign now if you believe in me i'm your king not just a savior i'm your king and we pray for the advancement of jesus's kingdom across this world we pray for god's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven that means whatever God's will is in heaven, it's executed on earth here, right? We pray for the full reign of God to consummate one day where Jesus will be king over all the earth, of course, he'll come back. We pray for our daily needs provision. Notice he says, give us this day our daily needs. It says our corporately, we pray for our daily needs for our, our brothers and sisters, for everybody. We pray for forgiveness. We ask God to forgive us of our debts, unconfessed sins. We ask God to lead us not in temptation. We ask God to sustain us in strength and temptation, to give us sustained strength in the midst of temptation, to allow us to turn from sin. When that temptation comes, we're, we're able to turn from that. But also if we're in a trial in life, because temptation is also a trial, that God would sustain us in the midst of that. And we ask God to deliver us from the evil one. That's the way that should be translated, not deliver us from evil, it's evil one. Just like Paul talked about in Ephesians 6, Paul was aware of the schemes of the enemy. And, you know, that's got a lot in it, but that seems to be what Jesus is concerned about, some of the things Jesus is concerned about. So if you want to know what to pray about, you need to pray about those things. You say, well, that prayer was something I learned as a kid and I outgrew it. Well, if you outgrew the words of Jesus, then I don't know what to tell you. I guess you're just smarter than everybody else. Um, now, Jesus also prays a prayer in John 17. The high priestly prayer, you can study that prayer. Those are some things he's concerned about, about unity, some other things you can study that prayer. He also prays in Mark or Matthew 9, 38, Luke 10, 12, same you know, parallel text. He prays that God would send out laborers into the harvest. Pray for God to send out laborers into the harvest. So 
Those are some of the things Jesus is concerned about. It's not that he's not concerned about your own personal needs, but you, know, you go back here and you say, well, you know, what, what is Jesus? What should we pray about? And what do we pray about in Jesus's name? Of course, you pray. You can pray everything in Jesus's name. But if you want to some of the things Jesus is really concerned about, he gave you a model right there. It's a model for prayer. You don't have to pray that way. It sure as heck is a good way to get started, though, if you struggle with prayer. Those things cover about everything you need on a daily basis. You're acknowledging who God is. You don't start out your day without acknowledging God, right? You don't put God before you before your day. You should put God before you even do anything in your day, right? You want his name to be holy in your life. You want his kingdom to be advanced. Those are God-centered prayers. His name, his reign, his rule, his will. And then you pray for yourself, your needs, daily provision, other people's needs, forgiveness, sustaining strength and temptation, and then protection from the evil one, right? Okay. Now, what about arguing with God in prayer? It's a good question. Can we argue with God in prayer? We could just argue with God. You know, Moses started interceding in Israel's behalf and offered, asked God several reasons, reasons to relent on his judgment. You know, he first said the Egyptians might hear of the situation and interpret it as weakness on God's behalf. So look what he says in Numbers 14, 17, and 19. He says, now, if you kill this people as one man, then the nations will have heard your heard your fame, we'll say, is because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land that he had killed them. Second Moses argues based on God's character. Now, please let the power of the Lord be great as you promised, saying the Lord is slow to anger and abounding steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Please pardon the iniquity of the pe this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you've forgiven this people from Egypt until now. So Moses seems to offer two arguments, one for God's reputation, one for God's character. You guys are probably familiar with Abraham's dialogue with God about destroying Sodom, about the people in Sodom, you know, who are there, um, arguing with God about that. You know, it may, sometimes he may say, say, well, that just seems disrespectful or foolish to argue with God. You can't argue with God. But it seems that Abraham and Moses are kind of arguing with God. So what, what's going on there? Okay, so this leads... To the next question, does prayer change God's mind? Maybe they change God's mind. I mean, you know, they're arguing Moses is interceding and remember God did relent his judgment and Abraham seems to have this dialogue and God says, yes, I'll do that. I will, you know, save the 50. I'll save the, this amount or that amount in Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, the whole thing. Um, so remember that when we talk about God, who God is, his character. So we talk about God's immutability that means that God's nature never changes. He doesn't, his nature can't change. So just call something immutable means it doesn't change. To call something mutable, it means it's subject to change, right? For example, you and I change. Plants, animals, roadways, lunches, all these things are mutable. We change over time. Everything, just about everything around us changes, mostly. Maybe not, if there's maybe a few other examples I could find, but the point is that we can gain height and weight. We gain knowledge, lose knowledge. We can acquire skills or lose skills. So we're always subject to change, but God in himself never changes. His nature does not change. He can't go through any change, okay? There's nothing, he doesn't lack anything. That's why, I, as you were here before, I said that time that why did God create us? Some, well, God was lonely. He needed fellowship. Now, that is so erroneous. Okay, God doesn't lack anything. He didn't create you because he needed fellowship. If he's lonely, that means that he lacks something, but he's not a perfect being. He didn't create you because he's lonely. He's a trinity. He's a triune being in perfect fellowship, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They don't need any more fellowship. They created us because they wanted to share their love with us, okay, because they're a tr God is a triune being. He created us because he wanted to share that triune love with us, okay? Now, you know, do we have a role then in changing what God has said will come to pass? There are scriptures that talk about certain times where God says he's going to judge. Like, you know, there's Amos 7, 1 to 6, where 
you know, God gave Amos several visions of the future judgments he was planning, then God seemed to change his mind in light of Amos's intercessory prayer. And of course, you have Jonah, who is sent to Nineveh. God says, go and preach to them, and if they repent, I'll change my mind about the judgment. And then there's that passage, you know, there's times in other places where the Lord intended to destroy Israel, as I talked about, and was ready to destroy Aaron, but Moses did that 40-day intercession, and God ended up not doing that. So what's going on? Did, we change, did they change God's mind? There's some other ones, conditional prophecies, uh, Jeremiah 18, 7 to 8. You know, there's that where he says, If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is be uprooted, torn down, destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, that were lent not afflict on it the disaster I planned. Ezekiel 22, 30, the Lord uses the same expression. He says, I look for a man from on them who would repair the wall and stay in the gap before him a half a land, so I would destroy it, not destroy it, but I found no one. Numbers 14, 11 to 20, God says it'll destroy Israel. Moses pleads for mercy and God doesn't destroy them. So, you know, we are, you know, you reach that point where you're saying to yourself, you know, if Moses and Abraham had not prayed in those passages I talked about, would God have done the opposite? Does the Bible tell us that? Does the Bible tell us what would happen? Would God do the opposite? Not necessarily. It doesn't give us really any information on that. There's just no information. So all we can do is speculate, which, you know, one, one thing that we need to remember when we studied the Bible, don't try to make the Bible say something that it doesn't say or give you information that it doesn't give, okay? Christians tend to ask a lot of questions about the text that the original author wasn't thinking about and the original author didn't really care about and the original author gives you no information about because we're 21st century Westerners and we want to know everything and we're reading an Eastern text. We expect the Bible author to tell us everything and sometimes he doesn't. So we just don't have any information of what God would have done. Now, do I think personally that God knew ahead of time what he was going to do when Moses came to him and Abraham came to him and interceded? Yes, I do because God has foreknowledge. He knows way ahead what he's going to do. Did God's character change through that? Did he, did he go through a change in his nature when they prayed and then he relented and didn't judge? Did his, did his nature change, his very essence? No. No. Nothing, nothing changed, okay? Is God dependent on our prayers? I hope not. That means he would lack something. He wouldn't be a perfect being. But the point is what happens with prayer Prayer, of course, changes us, okay? Prayer definitely changes us, and that's why it's good for us. And it reminds us of our limits in revealing the extent of our weaknesses. It reminds us of our frailty, how frail we are. It certainly highlights the distinction between God the Creator and we are the created ones. It certainly creates humility and dependency, and it can build patience and endurance. But if you're asking me to perfectly to give you a perfect answer for the relationship between God's foreknowledge, um, we pray, and God seems to change his mind, like how, how that all works together, like, like if I've got it perfectly figured out, I do not have it completely figured. I don't think anybody does. But I do know that God does not go under any fundamental change in his, in his nature or character. We change. Of course. And hopefully we get changed in prayer. Some of us have come out of prayer prayer battles where we're just weathered. You know what I mean? Like you just, you've been praying and praying and praying hard and praying hard and you build up patience and endurance and humility and dependency. And you're just almost sometimes worn out from praying the same stuff because you're like, God, when is this going to change? When's this going to happen? I prayed and prayed and prayed. Maybe sometimes you just gave up and just stopped praying about it. You know, you're just like, I've just given up. That can happen. The prayer is supposed to change us, of course, but God doesn't lack something where he needs us, okay? He uses us, he chooses to use us, and he allows us to engage with him in fellowship and prayer and communion, but he's not lacking something, okay? If he lacks something, then he's not a perfect being, okay? We lack something, that's why we need him. And that doesn't mean God's like a stoic rock. He's not involved in our lives. He's very involved, okay? 
Just want to make sure I clarify that. Now, what about must Christians forgive others who have sinned against them before God will answer their prayers of forgiveness? Well, of course, we have the text in the Sermon on the Mount, because the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5 to 7, right? All three of those chapters, even though the chapter divisions weren't there originally. But in Matthew 6, 14 to 15, there's those conditional sentences, if you forgive, for if you forgive, but if you do not forgive. So you have like a conditional statement is like an if-then statement, right? If you do this, this will happen. If you don't do this, that'll happen, right? So Jesus says, if you forgive, then your heavenly Father will forgive you. He says, if you do not forgive, your heavenly Father will not forgive your trespasses. There's a parallel passage in Mark eleven twenty five 25. It says, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so your Father also is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses, right? So this is a challenging message. It's one of what we call the hard sayings of Jesus. I have a book called The Hard Sayings of Jesus. And this is a challenging message, okay? It's a, it's a message on discipleship that we must do our best to forgive others before God will answer our own prayers of forgiveness. Now, we may assume that, let me, let me go back to, I'll go back to that slide. Let me go to this slide. We may assume we must probe our m memories to find every single long forgotten, unforgiving thing in our life from an earlier time. So maybe someone wronged us a long time ago, never forgiven them, or maybe it was recent. Um, God doesn't expect us to rack our finite minds of every single thing. Okay, this, that's very, going to be very difficult to do. I think we need to be realistic. Um, but we need to try our best to confess to God who we are not forgiving and who we need to forgive and release them over to God. Okay, you may have to do that continually because if you're harboring bitterness or resentment towards somebody, that may be a daily thing where you have to go to God, God, forgive. I release this person over to you. I choose to forgive them out of obedience to your word. Lord, it's Thursday tomorrow. I'm forgiving them again. I'm releasing them over to you today. Friday, I'm releasing them over to you today. I'm asking you to forgive me and I forgive them. That may be a long process for some people, certain people in their lives or certain situations. But we try our best to forgive. But it is true that if you have some sort of broken relationship where you you have this unresolved bitterness or resentment that's long term and you don't deal with it that's going to impact your relationship with god that doesn't mean god's not there it doesn't mean god doesn't hear you i'm just saying there's certainly it's going to create some distance between you and god so you need to try to release that person over to god as on a regular basis if you can Obviously, sin sometimes hinder our prayers. There's anything can hinder our prayers. Of course, sinful actions. I mean, you know, God warned the Israelites through Isaiah. He talked about, you know, you come to worship me um, through this ritualistic worship and your hearts are far away from me. You know, you're not, your hearts aren't right with me. Your hands are full of blood. Um, you know, so definitely you know, sin can hinder our prayers with God that we need to be confessing our sins. Like I said, we can't always recall every single sin we've committed. Okay, I'm not at, it's not like perfection. Okay, that gets into legalism. But when we cherish sin, harbor doubt or harbor, you know, selfish motives or just sin and we harbor it and keep holding on to it, that definitely impact our relationship with God. Um, so that's why, like I said, we need to be coming before God regularly and trying our best to just confess our sins to him and just saying the Lord, Lord, if there's anything I haven't confessed or someone I haven't released to you or released them today, and I'm asking you to cleanse me from that, and I'm coming to you. Now, what about learning from Paul's prayers? Just a few more things about Paul's prayers. This is, this is a great book. You can get this book by D.A. Carson. I called it Spiritual Reformation, Praying with Paul. He did a exegetical study of Paul's prayers. D.A. Carson's a well-known New Testament scholar. It's an old book. I read it years ago, but there's a newer second edition came out. But look at what Paul prays. Look at the richness of this prayer. Once again, he's writing to a group in Ephesus, right? He's not writing when he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven on earth is named according to the riches of his glory. He may grant you. He says, grant you. He's writing to that group in Ephesus. 
the entire community, right? To be strengthened. So when you guys read this and you're like saying, oh, that's me. He's pointing to me. Remember, the Bible wasn't written to you. It was written to them. But it's written for you as well. It's, it's, it's not written to us, but for us. So can you make an application of this in your own life? Sure. Just remember the original audience wasn't you. Okay, he says, for this reason, I bow my, and you're like, he's getting really repetitive with that. I'm getting tired of hearing it. I know, I'm, it's annoying. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through the spirit, through his spirit in your inner being, so the Messiah Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted to ground love and have the strength to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ surpasses knowledge, be filled up with all the fullness of you. Yes, Paul wrote that to a group in Ephesus. And yeah, you can pray that for other Christians and pray that for the body, the community of believers, you included. It's, it's a great prayer. It's rich. He also prays in Colossians 4. You know, he says, he prays for steadfastness and he prays for door to be open to the gospel. He actually does that in Ephesians 6 too. But he says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful and with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us also that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account which I am in prison, that I make it clear which is how I ought to speak. So he's asking for prayer for himself, that he would be a door and open to preach the gospel. And he's talking about being steadfast in prayer. And this is one of my favorite things he prays at Colossae. Remember, he's writing to the audience in Colossae, the Colossae believers. He says, so from the day we've heard, he says, we have not stopped praying this for you. How'd you like to be prayed? How'd you like someone to pray this for you as a group or your church every day? Not see, stop praying for you. Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, that's God's will, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God's being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Ooh, that prayer is rich. That is rich, right? So look how Paul prays. His prayers have content and spiritual depth, you know, and just um, they're rich, right? Then when he talks about rejoice always, Pray without ceasing, other proof text, got to read in context. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You may say, what's God's will for me? There's one thing he talks about being his will for you. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. To pray without ceasing is to develop the practice of praying as a normal part of our lives. So to pray without ceasing doesn't, you know, when I talk about praying without ceasing, yeah, you can pray in your car on the way to work. You can pray anytime you're walking or taking a jog or working out or doing the laundry, doing the dishes, cooking a meal, whatever. That's praying without ceasing. Now, that doesn't replace intentional or formal times of prayer where you set aside a time, just you and God, like you're totally focused. Um, you know, that's not replacing that. It's just praying without ceasing can include everything, you know, regular thanksgiving, adoration, petitionary prayers, intercession, but it's just a conscious dependency on God. We're aware of God's presence in our life. We're talking to him, you know, constant dependency. That's a means to walk in the spirit where we're constantly dependent on God and we are aware of the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives and we're asking God continuously to intersect in our lives daily. We're constantly dependent on him, okay? Well, Part of walking the Spirit means being yielded to the Spirit, but your yield to the Spirit is, part of that is when you're praying to God, depending on God, right? And prayer is certainly getting real with God. You know, we don't, it's not about being stiff, it's just being honest before God. You know, you can't hide anything from Him. You don't have to, like, come up with, Oh, great Heavenly Father, I'm trying to impress you. Oh, God Almighty, Father, Creator of Heaven and Earth, you are the great awesome God, omniscient, omnipresent, uh, all-knowing, all-powerful. I mean, you don't, you don't have to impress them, okay? It's just, it's just, it's a conversation. So you can, it's good that you could just be as real as possible. Just tell them what's on your mind, what's on your heart. And you definitely can't hide a darn thing from him, okay? 
I really believe also that it's really important to pray specifically. Okay, God wants us to be specific. It doesn't hurt to write out your prayers and write them down and keep a list or journal of what you pray about. That way, when God answers certain prayers, you can go back and look to see where he acted and he worked in your life, right? Sometimes what we do is we just pray and go about our day. We don't even remember what we prayed about, right? Of course, that happens with rocket prayers. Rocket prayers, well, God, just uh, uh, bless this day. I got to get to work and um, just help me today. Amen. Okay, I mean, it's better to pray, not to pray at all, but those are like rocket prayers. I'm talking about where you're, maybe has some real areas of focus that you're trying to pray about, and it's good to write them down and be specific. I know God wants us to pray specifically. I have learned that over the years. Now, when Dallas Willard wrote that book, I talked about this before, he was, Dallas Willard was a uh, philosophy professor at the University of Southern California. And he uh, also wrote a lot of books on Christian spirituality. He passed away about three years ago. But he talks about, in his book, The Spirit of the Disciplines, How God Changes Lives, he talks about disciplines of abstinence and then disciplines of engagement. And so he talks about how these disciplines of abstinence, these things we do, get us ready for the engagement in the world. You know, when we practice these things and abstinence, we don't have to be seen by others doing them. You know, Jesus talks about praying, not being seen by others, or fasting, not being seen by others, and secrecy, doing things in secret. We don't have to be seen by others. Everyone's like, oh, you did, you're so great, you did this. We don't necessarily have to do everything to be recognized. And then there's disciplines of engagement, study, worship, celebration, and we come together as a community, fellowship, confession, things like that. Do you notice that Jesus, um, in many cases, that he got alone with God. He practiced solitude and prayer. He was being pulled at all day long. Jesus, come heal me here. Do this, do this exorcism, heal my child. There's leprosy all over the place. I mean, he was he was in demand all the time. And I'd imagine that he got tired. Remember, Jesus was human. He was fully God, but fully human. He had to go to the bathroom, had to eat, slept. You guys, I, you guys may not have that totally figured out. That's okay. That's what's called the hypostatic union, which nobody's completely figured out. But there's times you'll see where he definitely broke away from everybody. Okay. He got away and got alone with God. Okay. And sometimes they didn't like it. They'd be like, where'd he go? He's vanished. He's, he had a priority. Years ago, there was, I read something about a gentleman who he said he made an appointment with God. He says, I have an appointment with God every day when I get up at this certain time, so I'm in bed by 10 p.m. every night. So he said, I made an appointment with God 30 years ago. I've kept that appointment every day. And he said, so when I'm out somewhere, I'm doing something, it becomes 10 o'clock. People are like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm going to bed. So, you know, he doesn't, he literally just leaves. Like he's in a social setting, he just leaves. It's like, I got to go to bed. I'm leaving, I'm going home. That's how disciplined this guy was. Like, I can't do that. Maybe you can't. I'm just saying an example. This guy made a commitment. He wanted to have an appointment with God. Nothing was going to disrupt that. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Okay. Now, there's no doubt that um, the distraction is a huge problem. I think we all know that. Distraction is a natural issue for most humans. Some of us are just distracted people. Some people just have a hard time sitting still, focusing. Sometimes we just have always been that way. Maybe it's just part of our personality. And of course, attention is a finite thing. We're finite humans. We don't have a perfect attention span. Only God does because God is truly undistracted. You know, God's not sitting around going, well, you know, I got to check Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and Twitter, you know, I've got things to do before I answer your prayer. He's not distracted by anything. So distraction is certainly a problem. And I think we all know that hopefully we do know that concentration is a skill that can be practiced and developed. There are some people that seem to have the ability to ignore things around them. You know, when they're getting lost in their job, they're totally focused on their job or reading and some people can do this with prayer. Other people, it's very hard. Uh, but we have to start identifying the things that distract us, that hurt our concentration level. There is no doubt that 
I think we all know that technology is this quote here technology was made for humans not humans for technology without critical reflection or use of it technology will make slaves of us all and there's no doubt as i said before your brain was not designed to take that much information and in on a daily basis okay on your phone or your computer so when this guy wrote this book 12 ways your phone is changing you he really nailed it and this book isn't too old i have it i think it came out maybe three years ago but he talks about some of the things that our phone is doing to us he says you know we're addicted to distraction checking our phones alarming rate distracting us from god life in the world around us we ignore flesh and blood in preference to our smartphones we crave the immediate approval that likes provide social media we're losing literacy and the ability to follow long flows of thought we feed on the produce fantasize images of life staging our own experience produce an inflated image to others we become like we become like what we like, dwelling on things we never knew we want until they presented to us. We become lonely as we are, as we use our smartphones for semi-personal interactions through apps or simply block out the world around us. We get comfortable in secret vices, sins that are so easily accessible on our phones. We lose meaning as the quality of needless information available makes it difficult to access quality or needed information. We fear missing out on information or affirmation. We become harsh, letting our frustrations out in others in public ways. We lose our place in time and get lost in a vague sea of instant access material. So he's right. Um, your phone, you were not designed to process this much information on this, this device or any social media. Your brain is not designed to do that. So it certainly has, has distracted us. And that's why, let's be honest, that if you're going to be disciplined in your prayer life and going to build a relationship with God, you're going to have to be more and more intentional about things that distract you. You know, I, I saw this video, I was watching this clip of a guy talking about masculinity, male masculinity. Um, and he said that he works with a lot of men helping them become grow in their faith. And a lot of times, he says that uh, they, they come to him and say, I'm not motivated. I'm just not motivated to pray. I'm not motivated. And he says, I'm not looking for motivated men. I'm looking for disciplined men. Okay. I'm more interested in discipline. He said, because he said, what you need to do is make a decision ahead of time, what you're going to do. Like you don't wait till you feel motivated. If you wait till you feel motivated, you probably won't do anything. So he says he makes these decisions ahead of time in his mind, makes a conscious decision. I'm going to do this, this, or this. And it's an issue of discipline. He decides he's going to do it. Now you guys may, you may say that can apply to women too, by the way, but you may say, well, that just sounds too easy. And I have issues. Well, maybe, but it's just something to think about it. When we just wait to be motivated, if you're going to wait for a feeling to come over you to be motivated. You may never do anything, right? Now, I'm not discounting the fact that some people have mental challenges, and if you have depression issues or anxiety problems and you, you're on medication, I'm not making fun of that. I'm not belittling that. I'm not saying that doesn't matter. I'm just saying that um, you have to think about sometimes, you know, how we, when we talk about getting motivated for things. So distraction is definitely something that's a huge issue. And we're, as I said, concentration can be learned, practiced, and developed. But we're going to have to work even harder in a very distracted age if you want to follow the Lord. Okay. Well, I hope I answered some of your questions about prayer. We didn't cover everything. There's not enough time to cover every single question there is about prayer. But I hope that some of these things have gotten you to think about your prayer life and what you're doing with it. And I don't really have anything more to say. So I'm going to go ahead and stop.